To be true and stay focused on Dr. Diamond's STEM 41. He then starts going into genetics and statins and starts talking about KIF-6. And I don't really spend much time on that. I used to use KIF-6. I still offer a lot of genetics, cardiogenetics. But to me, I think that's that rates as a money hole. And I really don't think it's critical to the discussion. Now, his next focus point is to get into criticism of big pharma and defense of his own potential conflicts. He says it's okay with neurology. See, he's not a cardiovascular researcher. He's not a physician. He's a research doctor in neurologic diseases. And he says big pharma is not a big deal with neuro. I've had pharma grants. That's what he's saying. I personally, Ford Brewer, I've not had any big pharma grants. And he goes on to say, I just haven't seen pharmacy work with cardiovascular disease. I'm amenable to more pharma dollars. Again, those are his quotes. If it sounds like I'm criticizing his position, I'm not. I've, you know, I've worked with plenty of docs who brought in plenty of research grant money. Yes, I'm very much aware that it can cause major conflicts. I saw the movie 20 or 30 years ago with Harrison Ford, the remake of The Fugitive. I understand that that kind of stuff has happened, but that's not the topic of what we're doing here. Big Pharma, I will agree, Big Pharma is led by human beings and human beings tend to try to make money. Human beings tend to get caught up in conflicts of interest. Human beings sometimes do the wrong thing. And that happens here too. But that's not really the issue. We're going to get into the issue in just a minute. While David Diamond was talking about this stuff, he gave one of my favorite quotes, though. He said, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. He accredited that to Benjamin Disraeli. A lot of people do, but there are other people that get credit for that as well. I don't think it's really clear. Now, this is interesting. Dr. Diamond then goes back to the Jupiter study and then starts talking about relative versus absolute risk. And that's where a key component of this whole issue begins to focus. He said 0.7 versus 0.4, 50% relative risk. And he said, that's just offensive. That's offensive to me that Pharma is quoting it that way. They're doubling the benefit and using relative versus absolute. Well, first of all, and again, this is a little bit critical of Dr. Diamond. The quote was inaccurate. It's actually 1.36 versus 0.77. But again, beyond that, I think we're all missing the point. He's going on to say, if you treat 100 people the way Pharma would recommend, you're only going to save one person. It's more like a 1% improvement. That's the absolute risk. But they're saying if you already have disease, you save half of those folks. In other words, two people out of the hundred have disease. If you give it to all a hundred, you're going to save one person. And they're quoting the, you save half the sick people. So therefore 50%. That's a little bit of an oversimplification. But again, I go there to help you understand the real question. Now I'm going to try to get to the point that I think is the real answer. Again, what we used to call at Hopkins, denominator medicine. What we're getting confused about is the denominator. Is the denominator everybody age 50 and above, everybody age 60 and above, everybody with a, an LDL of 70 or above? You know, you saw these LDL graphs. If you give it to everybody with an LDL of 70 or, or above, you're effectively going to be giving it to everybody. Now let's go back and look at the core findings, the key findings from the Cafe de Caves study. We're talking about plaque here. The most common way of knowing about plaque or maybe one of the three best ways these days is just get a coronary calcium score or a CIMT. This study was done using CIMT. It's the landmark study doing CIMT. And so here's what they found. They took what, 10,000 people and they said, We've got two groups, a normal group and a group that has plaque that's obstructing the flow. And we're just gonna follow those 10,000 people. Well, of the people that had no detectable plaque, 0.1 had an event, 0.1%. Of the people that had so much plaque, it was obstructing their flow, 81% of those had an event within 10 years. So those people were at significant risk. One thing that you might notice, and it's the value point of CIMT, everybody else, these two bands here would not be picked up on your typical stress test because they're not obstructing flow. 
But if you have significant plaque on a CIMT and it's not even impending the flow, you still had a 40% probability of having an event. So now we get into the real question. Who would say which group needs to be treated? Now, the pharma would say, okay, since everybody has some level of risk, give everybody statins. And when you get these people, you'll say, you'll cut the risk in half for those people. David Diamond would say, wait a minute, that's not true. That's giving it to too many people. Give it to nobody. So therefore nobody's helped. I'm saying something slightly different. I'm saying clearly these folks, the 80%, we know that who's in that 80%. And if you've got an 80% probability of having a heart attack over the next 10 years, wouldn't you like to cut that down to half? And here's where the CIMT gets involved. If you've got enough plaque to show a discrete plaque, you've got a 40% probability. And wouldn't you like to cut that down to 20? So that's the whole issue. Hopefully I didn't confuse things too much for you. But that's where we get into this whole debate of statins and absolute risk versus relative risk. So you get back to wrap it up and now you begin to see how I could agree with Dr. Diamond all the way to the very end, but have a very different conclusion. Most statin scripts, according, you know, I would agree that most statin scripts could be labeled as worse than useless, more harm than good. They can be a distraction from the real issue, lifestyle versus medications. And medications are not the way out of heart attack and stroke risk. Lifestyle is. Most statins, the reason I'd say most of those prescriptions are worse than useless is that most are prescribed on LDL level and or age using something like Framingham and not using something like documentation of plaque. You know, Framingham is not a measurement, it's a guess. And Framingham, I'm not the only person. Ridker here, guys at Harvard, guys at Mayo, all the leading cardiovascular research units have said the same thing. Framingham is too high. The estimate is double the actual risk especially for people, for women, not quite so bad with men, but it's not a great guess. So if your doc, which is the usual practice in the community, if your doc is prescribing statins based on Framingham, you're likely to be getting a statin when you don't need it. Now, once you have plaque, you go from about a 1% probability of having a cardiovascular event to 40%. Once that plaque gets big enough to impede flow, you go to 80%. I would think, if your risk is 40 or 80%, you'd want to start taking advantage. Even if it's a medication, even if it's not as important as lifestyle, you might want to consider it. So again, it's CV inflammation, cardiovascular inflammation, not LDL. Therefore, low dose is all that's needed and only for people with existing or proven plaque. Now here's one more final thing. It's sort of an add on. He said, the real demon here is carbohydrates, not fat. Again, I agree with him 100% on that. Getting carbs out of your diet is more important than taking a statin. Also, decreasing body fat, more important than taking a statin. Body fat's not just an inert energy storage tissue. It is an endocrine tissue and it secretes cytokines and some really ugly things that cause this problem. The goal is to keep insulin and glucose low. Other things that are important are exercise, not just aerobics, but resistance and high intensity interval training, even for older people. Sleep, poor sleep is going to become the new smoking where people recognize huge risk here that we just didn't understand before. Get a sleep monitor, start watching your sleep. Breath training. Breath training is important. You know, one of the worst things, the bad thing about breath training is most people think it's an airy, fairy, silly, soft item. Yes, when you look at a lot of the research, there is some good solid research for transcendental meditation, other types of meditation. There is some solid research around biofeedback, but it's really equivocal. If you go to the American Heart Association, you go to the FDA, they're very clear that you've got really good research in terms of device-driven breath training. It has a huge impact on blood pressure, stress, anxiety, and as we talked about a minute ago, sleep. So thanks for your patience with me as I went on and on and on. So I'd like to talk with you a minute about the webinar. People don't understand what the webinar is. 
it's actually a great way to get some access to healthcare that you're just not going to get any other way. You actually get the lab tests yourself for at a local lab, a Quest lab near you, for the inflammation panel and the OGTT and the insulin survey. These are things, inflammation and prediabetes, that your doctor just does not know about. And here's the thing. Harvard Health and many others have said, look, sudden death is not always so sudden. The Hollywood picture that it's a bolt out of the blue is not realistic. It's more like real lightning, preceded by clouds, wind, and rain. Stop that metabolic storm before the lightning strikes. And here's where that metabolic storm comes from. It's inflammation, and it has to do usually with prediabetes. So again, we actually get labs. We go over them in the webinar, and then you can start finding out how you can prevent that heart attack. Others said that you couldn't even predict. We can show you how. Thanks.